What's that? Old school today. Amen. Amen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Rabbi Zacharias tells the story about a boy who loved collecting marbles. And he had lots of marbles. And he met the girl who lived next door who liked marbles too. And she wanted some of his marbles. So she came up with an idea. She says, I'll trade you all of my candy for all of your marbles. The boy says, I'll think about that. So the next day they get together and, and before he got there though, he took some marbles out of his bag and he put them under his pillow. And then the trade was made complete. Marbles for candy. That night he couldn't sleep. He tossed and he turned and he tossed and his turn turned and he was just so upset. When his mother asked him what he was so upset about, he said, I couldn't decide whether or not she'd given me all of her candy. <laughs> In Luke's gospel today, we meet this rich young ruler and we, we, we've known this story and you've heard me even preach about this story, but, but this story is really important for lots of reasons. And, and one of the reasons is that it teaches us about what it means to dare greatly for Jesus. You see... This rich young ruler, educated, smart, probably good looking, like me, you know. <laughs> well, at least nobody denied it. That's always a good thing. Comes to Jesus. And he thinks he's so cool. Because he's got an audience with Jesus. And he says to Jesus, Jesus, what do I have to do to have it all? Now you thought he asked about eternal life, but think about what eternal life is. Eternal life is having it all. If you have eternal life, you have everything. He says, what do I have to do to have eternal life? And, and, and Jesus being Jesus looks at him and says, hmm, another one. Let's see if we can get him. He doesn't really say that. He turns to the rich young ruler and he says, well, you know the law. You know those things like don't commit adultery and don't murder and don't tell lies, and honor your parents. And the rich young ruler looks at Jesus in all honesty, I think, in all sincerity, and says, but Jesus, I've done that since I was a little boy, and it's not enough. What else? There's got to be more. There has to be something else I have to do so I can really have it all. Have any of you ever been the rich young ruler? Wanting to know what it is that you have to do to really get eternal life? What you really have to do to have it all? I'm guessing most of us in this room have been where this rich young ruler has been at one time or another in our lives. What do we have to do to have it all? And Jesus looks at him and says, well, there is, there is one more thing. Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but everywhere Jesus goes, 
there seems to be something he and Columbo had in common. <laughs> One more thing. Those of you who watch late night television got it. <clears throat> he says, young man, go home. Sell it all. Sell everything you have. Have a garage sale, an estate sale, whatever kind of sale. Get rid of it all and give it away to the poor. Now that's where we usually stop listening because we're always afraid the preacher's going to call us one of the rich young rulers. And we don't want to hear anymore after that. But the most important thing happens after this. When Jesus says, go, sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. That's the scene that we're in. Jesus has just told this rich young ruler to sell everything that he had. To give it away and come follow him. We all just breathed a sigh of relief because I reminded you that it was a rich young ruler and none of us in this room are rich. Right? If I said, how many of you are rich, how many of you would raise your hand? There are four hands. Okay. Okay. <laughs> The fact is, if you woke up in this country, you live in the, the most wealthy land, and you are in the top 10% of all of the people in the world. And I don't care what scale you use, if you live in the top 10% of income of all the people in the world, that qualifies you as rich. Well, there's another question. Well, I'm not a ruler. Oh, we're good at the excuses, aren't we? We're not rich. Oh, okay, so maybe we are rich. Well, I'm not a ruler. Oh, yeah? Who set your alarm clock last night? Okay, so Ed's not the ruler. <laughs> the fact is, who decided for you to come to church today? You did. Who decided when you'd get up, you did? Who decided? Who decided who you're going to vote for in the next election? You did. So you are ruler. So you are rich and you are ruler. Now that we've said all that, I'm going to tell you the real secret to this text. It's not about being rich. It's not about being a ruler. It's about being a follower. You see, I've heard lots of preachers say this text tells everybody to go sell everything, give it away to the poor, and go follow Jesus. Well, the problem with that is it's not true. This text does not say everybody at First Christian Church, sell everything, give it away, and come follow Jesus. It doesn't say that. It says, Jesus said to the rich young ruler, if Luke had known his name, Luke would have said his name. Go sell everything you have, give it away, and come follow me. Now, why does he tell the rich young ruler this? Well, we find out why when we find out that the rich young ruler can't do it. You see, the rich young ruler walks away unhappy, unsatisfied. Because he had so much. He suffered from greed. He suffered perhaps from selfishness. He suffered from the inability to do what Jesus had called him to do because his stuff got in the way. And here's what's really important in this whole text. 
Question number one for you to ask yourself today, what gets in the way of my being a follower of Jesus Christ? Because guess what? Your wife doesn't get in the way. Your children don't get in the way. Your job doesn't get in the way. Your family doesn't get in the way. You decide what comes between you and Jesus. And all of those things I just listed are in the top five of the things between Jesus and his people. The fifth one is money. What comes between us and Jesus? For the rich young ruler, it was all of his stuff. It was all of his money. It was all of his belongings. It was his wealth that got between him and God. So what gets between you and God? What keeps you from having the relationship you've been called to have with Jesus? You see, Jesus will have the same conversation with you if you'll let him. This rich young man, he wanted all that Jesus could give him. He wanted all that God had to offer. Think about this for a minute. What does God have to offer? Is there anything that God doesn't have to offer us? Is there? Is there love? Has he he made promises to take care of our basic needs? Has he made promises to uh, protect us from evil if we let him? Over and over and over through Scripture, there is promise after promise after promise about what God will do for you and me if we let him. So if there is nothing that God can't give us, then what keeps us from saying yes to God? This is a text that reminded me about another text in Luke from chapter 9. It's it's a text where Jesus tells three itty-bitty stories. And he says, first of all, he says, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Sounds good, doesn't it? If you were talking to Jesus, is that something you'd say? I'll follow you wherever, you, you wherever you'll go. Jesus looks at the guy and says, really? Do you know that foxes have holes and birds have nests, but, but I don't have any place to sleep tonight. Are you sure you're going to follow me? Oh. It's a pretty scary question. You willing to go with Jesus even if it means sleeping on the ground? You willing to go with Jesus even if it means uh, going down to, to, to our street mission? Does it, are you going to follow Jesus if Jesus says, um, go to Papua New Guinea with Marsha? If you think the street mission is a tough place to go, I'm, I'm thinking there are places in Papua New Guinea that might be just a bit more remote. It, would I be correct in that assumption? I would be. And they're in the midst of a drought. They don't have any water. Later in that chapter, he says, another man, he says to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Seems reasonable, doesn't it? Except his dad's not dead yet. Now think about that. Let me go bury my father. But we've got to wait for him to die. Jesus says, let the dead bury their own dead. Seems almost crass from Jesus. You go and follow me and proclaim the kingdom of God. The last, the last little story he tells is, says, man comes to Jesus and says, I will follow you, Lord, but, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Well, another one that sounds reasonable, doesn't it? 
Jesus looks at him and says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. You see, over and over and over again, one of the things that we're learning is that no matter who we are, no matter what we have, no matter what we're worth, no matter what our job is, no matter if we're a student or, or retired or rich or poor or middle class, Republican or Democrat, it doesn't really matter. Jesus says you're either all in for me or all out. And it's not the hokey pokey. We're either in with Jesus or we're out. The question becomes, are we all in? The good news is we get to decide. The good news is you and I get to determine for ourselves. Now, you don't get to determine for anybody else. It'd be so nice if we could all just determine for our children, right? It'd be great. Yep, they're in. They're in. They're in. They're in. We don't get that choice. We get to choose for us. Our spouses, our boyfriends, our girlfriends, our loved ones, they have to decide whether they're all in or not. We're in the midst of creating a budget at First Christian Church. Churches for years and years and years and years and years and years and years have been creating budgets. How many of you understand that scenario? Years and years and years of budgets? How many of you every time budget time comes around goes, I think I'm going to Papua New Guinea this month (laughs) while they do this. I've never been in a church where the budget process wasn't a pain in the patootie. That's a new theological word for (laughs) y'all. But I'm going to tell you a secret. In churches where people are all in for Jesus, budgets don't matter. In churches where the people are all in for Jesus, you find them having surpluses and new ministries and missions and ministry exploding around them. In churches filled with people who are all in for Jesus, we find excitement and growth and love and support and encouragement because we're all in it together. In churches where people are all in for Jesus, Jesus becomes the most important thing Not the church. And the church grows. And the money comes. If we don't want to worry about money, let's worry about being all in for Jesus. Because one takes care of the other. And it doesn't work in reverse. My friends, over and over again in Scripture, we see and hear stories like the rich young ruler. And the question from Jesus is always the same. 
And this is the answer to the test. Are you all in?